I am Vinny Todorich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. Just like the other guy on the other mic today, it's the Friday show. You know what that means. I bring in someone with a vast amount of knowledge, way more knowledge than I can ever have, and that's how we learn. We get people who actually know stuff. And boy, this guy knows stuff in spades. Um, just, just a little funny anecdote. Um, I was looking for him. And he was told, hey, you need to go on Vinny's podcast. So we were looking for each other. <laughs> and I just told Megan one day, I said, hey, go bird dog this guy. Go find out where he is. I need to talk to this guy because I saw a couple of videos and uh, this guy, I hate using the term knock my socks off because it sounds like 1968. Oh, he just knocked my socks off. Um, <laughs> but this guy uh, is doing it, right? He just, he blew me away and he's got a lot of heat around him. And I just wanted to bring him on and chat with him for a second. He's an adventurous or an adventure chef. We're going to ask him what that means because He's a chef, but he goes on adventures. And boy, what an adventure he went on. I'm talking about a guy coming to me from the UK. Mike Keane. How you doing, Mike? Hello. How you doing? I'm really good. Thank you. Was that a good introduction? I mean, we were looking oh. for each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we kind of crossed paths and um, ended up in each other's inbox there. That was, um, yeah, that was pretty handy. Yeah, I spoke for the first time yesterday, and here I am on your Friday podcast. That's awesome. You know, it's amazing, Mike, whenever I get a guy like you and, you know, I just called just to say hi and to see if you were up for this and doing the podcast and the whole thing. At one point during that conversation, I wish I could have just hit record and made that the podcast <laughs> because you're the, you're this interesting guy. And it's like, oh, my God, everything that comes out of his mouth is just interesting to me, which means it's going to be interesting to other people. So. Uh, kudos to you for being that kind of guy. Now, Mike, you lived all over the world. I mean, you didn't just start off in the UK. Um, uh, you know, you were in Saudi Arabia, uh, Nigeria, Germany, England. I think you're in England now. Yeah. Uh, Miami of all places, <laughs> Puerto Rico. <laughs> I can go on and on. I mean, it, it, you're, you know, and you know, you, you're on cruise ships. You've done it all. How how do, how does that happen? You you're not my age. You're close to my age, early fifties. How yeah. does it happen? And by the way, I'm going to add to that question. How does it happen? But number two, I want you to answer this also. Do you think kids today could do what we were able to do to get to where we are? Um, short answer is yes. I think I, I think you can. Um. It, 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 you might have to jump through a few more hoops for and get some more red tape, you know, cleared out of the way. But yeah, yeah, I think I, I think so. I think kids today are exposed to a hell of a lot more information on the media, a lot of it wrong. I think yeah, through social media, through the internet, and I think that kind of makes that makes for a, a seemingly worse world to be in. When in reality, I think if you compare it to yeah, you know. You know Era's gone by. I I I think we're living in an okay an okay time in terms of safety and the ability to get out there and do stuff. Um, you've just got to have that drive. And um, and back to your question is how, how do you do all this stuff? I think my main thing is that I'm 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 not particularly good at any one thing. So I just kind of do something for a year or two and then go, Hey, hang on. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not particularly fulfilled here. What can I do next? And then, and then if I think if you just expose yourself to opportunities, have a look at it, don't give anything up, don't, don't pass anything by it, it, it. Yeah. The right thing will come along, land in your lap and boom, before you know it, you're heading off to Miami to work on the cruise ships or you're going to Singapore to work in a restaurant, <laughs> Yeah, that kind of thing. So yeah, never give up. Sometimes, you know what you're dream what you're dreaming about isn't where you end up but the road to get there is really bloody interesting and it, it might take you on a different tangent which is a great thing yeah you know you know parents here in the, at least in the united states everything is about oh i have to get my kid in the right school and if i can get my kid in the right school i can get him to the right college 
and they get to write college, then they're set for life. And and nothing can be further from the truth. Um, yeah, if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, something like that, or if you want to be a nuclear scientist yeah. and work for, you know, NASA or do something like that, sure, you, you have to go through those steps. But I think people forget that there are a lot of jobs and a lot of things that, that you could do that could be very fulfilling in life that you, you don't need a college degree for. You don't need to waste that time and more than time, even money. You know, money, I don't know what, you know, I know it's it, you know, just got awful expensive here. And, you know, I, I talk to people, I'm going to name drop a little bit. Um, my buddy yeah. Mike Rowe um, does a thing here. You know, he does these scholarships over at Micro Works. And, um, I, you know, he's teaching kids how to weld and teaching kids all these different trades. Yeah. Those are things I was considering coming out of high school. And the only reason I went to a university, or as you guys would say, to university, um, was because I got a scholarship to play football. And I'm like, okay, let me just, you know, let me take advantage of this. I'm getting a free education. I might as well go take advantage. And the entire time I was getting my degree in exercise physiology and then a secondary education degree to go be a PE teacher on top of that, the counselors kept telling me at the school, at, at Tulane, the school I went to down south, um, you know, we can get you into law school. You you just have to take, you know, you know, the the LSATs and all that. You we can get you right into law school. Yeah. And uh, you know, we'll give you a we'll give you a partial scholarship just to come here, just to be here. And and I was like, Well, why are you guys so interested in me going to law school? And you know, it was to fulfill something for them. Yeah. They like to say that some of their student athletes end up with becoming lawyers and doctors because in fact most athletes fail out, right? Yeah. And when you when you got a you know a live one on the hook, you want to go with it. <laughs> they were willing to yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were willing to pay for that. And I remember telling a one of the guidance counselors at one time, I said, I, I couldn't imagine being an attorney, just you know, sitting in a office reading all day long and and you know, at the very, at the very least, screwing people over. That's all lawyers do, screw people <laughs> over. And yeah. he looked at me and instead of saying, yeah, you're right, he said, yeah, but PE teacher, really? You want to waste your life that way? <laughs> and I was like, educating people how to be fit? That's a wasted life? Wow, yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you ever feel like that? I mean... And by the way, I've changed what I've done a few times in my life. Yeah. And but here we are, right? Yeah, You're yeah. The same way. I mean, and I look at my brother-in-law who worked, you know, in London, you know, he was, you know, going to a job with a suit every day and the whole thing and living this life. Turns out he didn't like that life. He liked bird hunting. He loved pheasant hunting. He loved wor working and doing that stuff. He works yeah. in that industry now. You know, and he does two or three other things, but he's and by the way, your age, he's your, he's created a life. Yeah. Do, do I, I, I get that same sense when I look at you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I was about to, when you were saying, you know, guidance counselor, I remember when I, when I was like 15 or 16, I was at school, I think it was here in the UK at the time. And you, you know, you, you put all your information in this really kind of ancient computer and it, you, you get your ideal jobs printed out on this tractor paper thing that goes as it comes out. And my my, my, my my number one recommended career was dental technician, which is, which is like, oh, yeah, it wasn't even a dentist. It was like a dental technician. It's like, that's, yeah, we've put the numbers in and that's what it's come out with. You're, 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 yeah, you're, you're suited to work in the dental industry. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> Just, yeah, just so wrong. And and you're right. E education is so overrated. Yeah, obviously, if you want to, yeah, go to one of those, yeah, those big, well-paid jobs where the stress is super high, then you have to go through the uni. Yeah, go through all, all, all those hoops. But it, the, the best education is just getting out there and getting it done. You know, like I, I lived abroad all over as a kid, and that was the best education. That travel, meeting new people, yeah, different climates, different environments. And that's something I've, I've got four kids that are all grown up now, but that's something that I wish that I'd done for them is take them abroad. Yeah. Experience living in a different country for a few years, but I, I was too busy trying to, you know, trying to make a few bucks here. 
which didn't work out very well. But um, it, yeah, it just just you know busting uh, my nuts if I'm allowed to say that on the uh, on the old yeah. podcast, trying to make a living. And uh, whereas yeah, looking back, I should have focused on just getting out there with the kids. You can do it with the kids. You know, you you, you still can t- you can take them to different countries, get a job out there. Um, but I would recommend that to anyone listening. If you're not sure what you're going to do. If you're not driven to be a lawyer or a doctor or a NASA rocket scientist, get out there. Just just go traveling. You know, pick pick something that that enables you to do that. Like for me, it was food. Yeah, everyone needs to eat. Like everyone needs their haircut. You know, if if, if you can get a job as a good barber or hairdresser or a chef, go on the cruise ships. They're, yeah, if you're any good, people will snap you up. Yeah, that, that, yeah, the, the cruise ships were fantastic. Took me out on yeah all around the states or the Caribbean, South China Sea. And I was just cooking, you know, and hopefully I was I was a pretty good chef. But it, it just takes you it takes you out of your comfort zone and jo- drops you in a, a, a brand new place. And it, yeah, with hindsight, looking back, it's just fantastic. It's such a great experience. So go for it every time. So has it always been cooking for you? The main thing have you know they wanted you to be a technician, a dental technician, on top of everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how computers spit that out. It, you know, it's like that's pretty specific. But <laughs> did you look down the list? Did they say number five cook or anything? I mean, that cook did- wasn't on there at all. I, th- I think some kind of vet was down like number three or number four, which I, I, I kind of wanted to be. But over here, anyway, it's like seven years at university. It's like wow, that's a, that's like a whole lifetime. You know, so that 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 kind of didn't tick my box. But um, yeah, we, we were in Germany at the time when I was like 15, 16, 17. And I had to decide whether to go through the German school system through university there or come back to England and do something that I, you know, do something else. And I, I kind of like cooking. Yeah, I, I was never driven. I, you know, I, I wasn't a wannabe Gordon Ramsay. But um, I kind of enjoyed cooking. I thought, yeah, let's go back to England. So I did four years at college here um half of it was like yeah hands-on experience and the other half was classroom stuff and yeah like school the classroom stuff yeah just went in one ear straight out the other but the actual the, the experience and working in different kitchens and it's it's, it's it, you know there's a lot of adrenaline going on in the kitchens it's, it, it's quite an exciting place to be and obviously if you if you add cruise ships to that or working in new zealand or i, I was up in buffalo for a year as well um yeah, it, it, it can just take you anywhere you want to go. It really can. Did you start off as a line cook or did you go to uh, trade school and become a sous chef and work up that way? How did you work through? Yeah, I was, I was kind of working part time in pubs over here. So it was pretty much at, at the time. When was this? Like late 80, 88, 89. Um, yeah, the, the food in England was generally pretty bad. If When you went out to restaurants, it, it used to have a really bad reputation. And yeah, yeah, working in some pubs where it's just got like one person just banging out microwave food. And I was at college at the time, so I was kind of this wannabe chef. Um, so yeah, I was pretty much the only chef, like a spotty 17, 18 year old going in the kitchen and thinking he's some kind of hotshot Ramsey type person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, so it was kind of self taught. I never really went through any big brigades in, in hotel kitchens or anything like that. Um, I worked in Gibraltar, in, you know, in southern Spain for uh, a year as my work experience. So that was probably the biggest kitchen that I was in. And that was like seven or eight people. So, um, yeah, apart from the cruise ships, which have 50, 50 guys in. But that's that's really formulaic, you know, cooking by numbers stuff. Yeah, pubs can be, you know, I've, I've done a lot of pubs in England because, you know, my wife um, grew up in Dorset. Yeah. And um so that there's a proper pub right there, right? Yeah. And you can go in all day long and grab a beer, which I'm not a beer guy. Yeah. Uh, they always have a you know a proper lunch and there's things on the menu and there's it's a dinner. And I've always said this could rival any, probably not a five star restaurant, but it can rival any medium or middle grade restaurant. Yeah, you know, a, a really nice restaurant, no yeah. problem. Oh, oh, totally. Yeah. Pub, pub food is fantastic. And I've and I, I've, I've worked in a couple of Michelin star places where you've got like six chefs with tweezers putting tiny little micro greens on like the, the sixth course of 19 courses. And yeah. that's just, it, it, to me, I, you, know, you can appreciate the technical skill and, and the flavors and the, all the effort that goes into that. 
but I, I can't be doing that. I, I, I much prefer, yeah, picking up some chicken wings or some ribs, or just getting for a, getting a really good plate of steak and kidney pie or a really good sausage and mash. You know, that fish and chips is, is probably the best meal ever. Fish and chips is fantastic. Um, but and, and do it right, like a lot of pubs do it here in England. Um, it's 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 fantastic, and I, I would take that over a, you know, five hundred buck, yeah, you know, three three Michelin star restaurant anytime. Really would. Yeah, look, I mean, the one the pub I'm talking about, you know, yeah, you could get your fish and chips. It's not something I would eat because of all the batter and yeah, of course the the potatoes, but and the seed oils. But you could get duck. You know, there's always a duck on the menu. There's always you know that sometimes there's pheasant on the menu. Um, uh, there's always a pork belly or something. And I'm yeah, sitting there yeah. going, oh my god, you know, you would have to go to a nice restaurant in L.A. to get this. Yeah. Right. Uh, like you're not getting this. There's not normal, but the, I think the people in that village yeah. are used to that. Right. They, it's one of those old pubs that's been there for a thousand years. And yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you can really get good stuff there. Yeah. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk to you was, uh, you know, uh, you kayaked uh, several thousand miles. I can't remember, was it 7,000? 7, 7, no, no, no. It's, 7, it's, uh, two, two, two and a half thousand kilometers. So okay. it's like, it's under 2,000 miles. Yeah. Okay, so, and it wasn't just anywhere. It was up in it was up in Greenland, Iceland. Yeah, talk the, about the, it. It was the west coast of Greenland. So I, I I've been planning it for you know only about a year or so really, um, and I set off in April earlier this year from Kalkoltok, right in the south of Greenland, and yeah, pretty much mirrored the coast all the way up. Uh, and finished in Upernavik, which is yeah almost two and a half thousand kilometers north. And it was kind of under the umbrella of climate change, raising awareness um, of yeah you know, climate change is obviously affecting everywhere in the world. And it is yeah you know, Greenland is pretty much the poster boy of climate change because you've got the glaciers it's so visible there year on year. You can see the retreat of the glaciers. Yeah, the polar bears are always in the news. And um, and un underneath that kind of climate change umbrella, I did two scientific projects as well. So one of them was me collecting seal poo as I went up, um, not straight out of the seals backside, but uh, from the hunters who have killed the seals. So I, I, I took 100 gram sample each time and that has been analyzed for microplastic. So there's three organizations looking at all this seal poo that I took um, samples of all the way up the coast, just to measure which areas of the coast are particularly you know, threatened by microplastic pollution. And also to see if there's any extra coming in from the glaciers. So any glacial runoffs, because uh, there's a big fear now that loads of microplastic is coming um, you know, through air, through air airborne pollution, um, and then going into the sea that way. Uh, but the main one, and which I really loved as a chef, was uh, eating a, a purely ancient Inuit diet. So, yeah, the Inuit have been going through Greenland in waves for the last like six or seven thousand years. And when you get up there and there's no trees, there's no, yeah, barely anything edible grows there. And their diet has pretty much been keto uh, traditionally for thousands of years. So they've just eat seal mammal and the blubber, you know, all the sea, sea mammals, seal, whale, um, walrus up there. They've got huge amounts of fat, uh, reindeer and uh, musk ox and then fish. And that's pretty much it. And I was thinking, God, it's, it's like the, one of the most hostile environments on earth. And these guys, that's all they, that they ate for thousands of years. So they, they didn't touch vegetables, didn't touch fruit. Yeah, there's no carbs, there's no pasta, there's no rice, there's nothing. It's like, how is that possible when me as a chef um, in Europe and the States, it's continually drummed into you, like, you know, five a day we, we have here in the UK, you know, you're supposed to be five. Yeah, we, we have that same campaign here. Yeah. Fruit or veg um, a day, which I struggle to even in England. Um, and then as a chef, you, you, you know, everything's got to be you know, kept in the fridge in temperature. If it's a day pass at sell-by, you've got to throw it away. And there's something crazy like 35% of all food is, is actually thrown away. It's, it's probably something similar in the States as well. It's like, oh, that's that's just such a crazy figure. And I remember the tipping point for me was about eight years ago, I was opening a new pub and I wanted to do um, homemade salami and parma ham. So you, you cure it. Like like traditionally in, in Europe, you, you, you pack it in salt and then air dry it. And the EHO, the Environmental Health, that comes and checks all restaurants, 
um, said it's not possible. You, you can't do it because the, the, the optimum temperature for, for air drying is about 11 degrees, not between the you know, the, the four and six degrees that your fridge is supposed to be at. So, so I, 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 I kind of scoffed a little bit. I, th- I think I might have annoyed him. But um, I said, what do you mean? How is this possible? You know, that in Spain and Italy, they've got such a fantastic tradition, thousands, going back thousands of years of Parma ham and salamis and serrano ham, all this fantastic stuff. And you're just telling me it's not possible to make it. And and, and he said, yeah. So it, I, I could, he said, you, you've got to prove to me scientifically that it's going to be safe to eat, which which is absolutely ridiculous for a chef who's opening a restaurant. So, so that kind of got me into the whole thing about fermentation. And it's like, hang on, it's like in, in fridges, like for example, in, in England in 1963, only 5% of households had a fridge. That's like 1963. That was just before right. I was born. So what, what the hell have humans been doing for the, you know, as they've evolved for the last million years, you know, they, they right. haven't had fridges that whole time. It's crazy. So of course, you, know, you look into it and they're fermenting, um, they're, they're air drying, uh, they're salting if they can get hold of salt, but then you go up to the high Arctic and there's no trees. So you can't, you can't boil wa- you know, seawater and evaporate it to make salt. So yeah, but that's not a tradition out there. And that, that kind of took me into, you know how humans have evolved with food over you know five hundred thousand a million years to how we are today, and then looking at all the allergies and stuff that are coming in, and you go, hang, hang on a sec, we've we've evolved with this food. We, we you know we, we are as a species we evolved super slow. You know it's not like bacteria who are you know, you know being recreated you know, multiple right. times. Right. We take a long time to adapt to our food, so. You know, and pretty much for our whole existence as as a species, we've eaten what we can find within you know, a ten mile radius, and then suddenly within two generations, we have totally flipped that on the head. You know, we've gone from being super local um, foragers and hunter gatherers to flying stuff all around the world using fossil fuels. You know, everything is grown to maximize profits and yield, so it's pumped full of chemicals and fertilizers. It, everything's super processed. And then it's it's no coincidence that that kind of yeah well exactly tallies that crazy rise in diseases like heart disease, autoimmune disease, you know, diabetes. There's, there's so many things that are related to the diet, and it's it's crazy that we, you know we, we seem to be in this like hamster wheel of continually trying to make profits for shareholders, and that it, everyone kind of knows that it's bad for you, but we're going to do it anyway. Let's, let's just keep going on and making some you know making a few bucks which is crazy. So going back to the kayak thing, I thought, right, I'd love to see if it's going to be possible for me as a kind of someone who eats a fairly normal English diet can switch it and and survive in that environment as they used to do because yeah, you know, the kayak was invented in Greenland. So I was going to tick as many boxes um as I could of trying to replicate the life of an Inuit from thousands of years ago, you know, pre um, colonialization. Um, and that's what I did. So I, I was on the diet for 10, yeah, t- 10 days before I started kayaking because I'd, I'd done some research, obviously, and I was expecting some kind of um, interesting, <laughs> it, 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 interesting trauma to happen to my uh, insides, which was true. Yeah, so yeah, you have diarrhea because you, you, you totally cut cut out fruit, vegetables, carbs. So for the first week, it was quite interesting. Couldn't you know, venture too far away from the toilet. But and then I started kayaking, and it was it was yeah, my, my guts were fine. And then it just leveled out into yeah, normal kind of bowel movements. And then I was eating pretty much seal, whale, or reindeer as my main kind of meat, muscle, muscle food. And then trying to keep my fat content up to around 35 40 percent of that so there was yeah um big globs of of blubber basically seal and whale fat going in that food um and what what i wasn't expecting was how uh, affected the weather patterns had been um so it's, it's been a lot less predictable the last few years in Greenland and this time around it, it, it seems to have gone crazy this year like it has all over the world really in so many different weather patterns that have gone screwy you know look at Hawaii now and um what yeah uh, and uh, what it was with the um with, with the diet there and, and 
the try trying to cook <laughs> as you go in the, that kind of those kind of conditions the temperatures were about 10 degrees on average lower than they usually are at that time of the year so my kayak couldn't get through on the ship to start with because there was yeah the sea ice was crazy and you know, even the ships couldn't land so i was a week late starting and then constantly in the south um trying to get through the fjords they, they used to free freeze up overnight so i've you know there's a couple of videos there that i sent that are, uh, you know the kayaks in the ice and I'm, I'm I'm whacking the paddle through the ice and trying to lever the kayak forward um and then when you're in minus 12 degrees temperatures the intention it was well, what i had in my head was that i was going to be doing bit you know put the tent up it was, could be a little bit of sun i could be a bit chefy and do some nice food but it was so cold it's really amazing and it, it, it astonished me how functional food becomes when it's that cold you know you, you kayak in for between eight and 12 hours a day and as soon as you stop you get cold you got sweat right and then you've got to pull the kayak up over an ice shelf um so it's above the high tide put your tent up and then it's so cold and biting wind and blizzards that anything any idea you have of doing any fa anything fancy it just goes right out it the window goes right, yeah yeah heat it up quick as you can if it's yeah it, it, it like seagull eggs I, I picked up a lot of seagull eggs as i went off from, from different islands and which is a great food for doing quickly but then if, if you have a piece of raw seal it takes a long time to cook that so you so you can eat it otherwise it's you're chewing for a long time on it um so it, it really opened my eyes to how how the environment affects uh a, a, you know a, a nation's culture in in food which is why the greenlandic have a lot of dried food um to sustain them because you know they just air dry it um and that kept me going on in the kayak and the storms and the weather was so horrendous sometimes i was holed up in the tent for at one point for uh four days four days and three nights i couldn't get out the tent and luckily i had loads of dried food because i couldn't leave the tent let alone go fishing or hunting and and that has definitely dictated um a large you know i'd say pretty much all of uh, the the culture of their food out there is a massive part of it is dried food just because historically they they could have gone for two or three weeks without being able to hunt fresh food okay so, okay, so wait hang on before we before we even go on um i want to go back and unpack a few different things yeah uh, because i i can listen to you go on and on all day but there you, you went you glassed you, you went right past a few things i think we, we yeah. should ask first off um uh, I, just for the audience, uh, you had mentioned six degrees. He was talking about Celsius. We live in the United States. Uh, <laughs> if I'm doing my math right, six degrees Celsius is somewhere between 41 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I'm pretty good at doing that because I, I live with a Brit. Um, so I'm <laughs> just going to guess that that's that when he was talking about the fridge. And and, and I want that. Well, we're going to get back to it. Well, let's talk about that first. I know in restaurants here, because I had friends who were chefs and the whole thing, and I've been in the back of restaurants, there'll be signs in the United States, these eggs must stay at this temperature, you know, blah, 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 blah. And if you have fresh eggs at your house, you can just get them from the chicken and just throw them up on the counter. You don't have to put them in the fridge at all. They could be there for three or four days yeah. before you cook them in any way, shape or form, either boil them or fry them or do whatever you're going to do with them. Yet we have this crazy thing in the restaurants. They go, oh, oh no, can't do that. You got to, and I've had a, a chicken and egg expert on this show, and he yeah. goes, "Yeah, it's pretty much bullshit that you have to do that." But that's our government. You got that's what you have to do, and on and on and on. But before we talk about that, I want to go back. You talked about um, seal poop and plastic. Yes, and, um, you just kind of brushed by. Now. I, so, who put you up to this? Who said, "Oh, you're going to be in a kayak? Can you grab some seal poop?" <laughs> uh, how does this work? And then. What, why are they studying this? When did they figure out that there's plastic in in the seal poop? Yeah, it it comes. Well, it, it, both experiments came from me. I, I thought, right, I'm, I, I want to do this big kayak expedition. What else can I do? Is there anything useful I can do as I go? Because you know, I'm I'm pretty sure that if I'm kayaking for eight or ten hours a day, I'm going to get pretty bored at some point. Um, so I thought, yeah, the food thing is obvious because that's what I've been doing and talking about for for you know quite a few years now. 
And then a good friend of mine from Greenland actually lives in Norway now as was looking into microplastic and collecting it, you know, when he was out on the, on, on the kayak. So I got in touch with the guy who lives just on the road here from me and works for a, a European kind of environment agency type thing. And he said, it would be really fascinating to get some seal poo samples because, you know, the samples that they've had before, they've either, you know, had a, like some kind of drift net, a, t- a sieve type apparatus that goes at the top of the top of the water, and then sometimes they collect it when it's thirty meters down. But what the the beauty of seal poo, <laughs> if you can say that, is that the seal feeds on fish um, and, and yeah, crustaceans and stuff that um, are from the bottom uh, of the ocean to the very top. So everything is in its stomach gives you a, a beautiful kind of picture of of the state of the whole sea not just the surface or the bottom um so that's yeah that's why the seals are yeah the, the you know the best things to collect poo from to, to measure the microplastics and that they they're doing like tests on glaciers and um in, in rivers in greenland and they've kind of they're picking up on this airborne microplastic um uh problem now um so a couple of places where i collected the poo was from seals that had been shot or lived outside yeah or just from um by a glacier so the thing thinking being that the plastic has been taken through the air is, is coming down in rain or snow on the glacier melting and then being chucked into the sea that way so there's a possibility that the the areas of the sea that are yeah, directly outside a glacier are, are, are higher in microplastics than than the rest of the ocean, which would give them a good indication of what kind of percentage of pollution is coming from the air and what percentage is actually just coming from sea, from attrition, from fishing gear, or just all the microplastics that are in pretty much everything we eat now. You know, I, I think they found yeah microplastics in our blood and fetuses and all kinds of stuff. So it's it's pretty much yeah, universal. It, it seems like a scary thing. You know, we sit around in this country and, you know, we have politicians who are worried about cows farting. And, uh, you know, I saw in Ireland where they want to kill all the cattle because of the CO2 carbons and all things. I just did a, my third documentary. Um, it's called Beyond Impossible, where I talked about that. Yeah. Where, it, you know, they're looking at the wrong thing. It's It's almost like a misdirection. It's like, hey, look at this shiny object over here. A cow just farted. And, you know, a, 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 a sea lion just died at the North Pole. And, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. You know, we should be looking at automobiles. We should be looking at all the plastics, Benjamin, as we yeah. heard in the movie back in the early 1970s. And we're doing all the wrong things. You know, it's like we're not looking at the real problem. It's almost like industry is saying, hey, don't look at us. Don't yeah. look at the man behind the curtain. Just keep looking at these cattle over here. And yeah. I, I think about that. So are we just that fucking dumb? Are we really that stupid? Yeah. You, know, you know, and that's why I want to go back to it's like, wait, they're pulling microplastic out of seal crap. I mean, we got a real problem here, right? Yeah. Nobody's looking at that. You know, you hear about these big islands of plastic that's floating out in the ocean, out in the yeah, yeah, yeah. ocean, and all this kind of stuff. And here we are, you're telling me, oh, no, it's in the air. It's, it's dropping into the North Pole, and, and these seals are getting it from other marine life, and yeah. we find it right there in their in their crap, which yeah. I find fascinating. That I mean, will we ever hear about this, or is this just going to go by the wayside? Is yeah. this something else that's going to be buried? You know, yeah, probably, not, yeah. There'll be some yeah. kind of new TV show that, that knocks it into the bottom spot on the news or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the groundswell of people who are, are looking at the, all these things on climate change, you know, it's not such a, you know, five, ten years ago, it was, yeah, there, there was like huge, yeah, huge amounts of climate change deniers still. And then, yeah, they're still out there now, but it's, it's dwindling uh, and the evidence is building up yeah, by you know, the projects that I'm doing and you know, thousands of scientists and other people are doing all over the world. And you just have to look at the news, the crazy weather that's happening to see. Well, oh, shit, you're, you're going on. Thing. you know, you know, politically, I'm I'm you know, I'm a guy who gets blocked on the Internet a lot because I'm called a climate denier. OK, I'm I'm an outdoorsman. Yeah. I love the outdoors. I think we have a real problem. 
I see global warming just like everyone else. And by the way, we were calling it an ice age back in the 70s. Oh, we're heading to an ice age now. We're heading to a meltdown. So I, yeah. I'm not sure where we are, but we do know things are changing. Yeah. Right. I can see that. I'm just simply saying we're looking at cattle. We're looking at ruminants, and that's yeah, yeah. the wrong thing. We're not look. We're looking at something that's been here for gazillions of years, and of course, yeah. the vegans will come in and go, "Oh no, cattle! Are, that, that's a man-made. You know, we we make cattle. Yeah, but we didn't make deer. That's a ruminant. We didn't make buffalo. That's a ruminant. I could go on and on. Yeah, Giraffe, giraffes are ruminant, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, sounds about we right. We go yeah. on and on and on. There's yeah. ruminants all over the world. What about those? What yeah. about those ruminants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could be wrong about the giraffe. I'm not really sure. <laughs> we have a gazillion. Good. We have a gazillion ruminants that we didn't create. Yeah, we made beef cattle. We 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 did that. You you got yeah. us vegans. But are we going to get rid of Bambi too? That's what I need to know, right? We're, you know, I'm not denying Klein. I'm denying that these assholes are lying to you because there's a bigger problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you, you just got to look about. Yeah, what, what humans have been eating as we've evolved, and you know, they weren't vegans and they weren't vegetarians. And I, I, I'm not saying that everyone should go on this diet in Greenland, and I, I, I'll come to come to that in a bit and what effects it had on my body. Um, I'm not saying that everyone should copy that diet because it's it's, it's you know clearly everyone can't eat seals and whales because there won't be any left. But it suits the people in Greenland because that's what they've been doing for thousands of years, and that's what's in their environment. You know, if you if you took that kind of the the, you know, the same project and put me in I don't know, Bangladesh or Peru, for sure I wouldn't be eating seal and, seal and whale. I'd be eating, yeah, a, a bigger part of my diet would be potatoes and, and, and vegetables and, and grains and pulses. And and the meat, the meat content would go right down. But that's that's one of the beauties of of of, of humankind is that we don't all fit in that same neat box. You know, some of us are pure just gonna eat meat, and some of us are just gonna eat vegetables, and that's okay, you know. Yeah. But 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 to but but to stay in your little box and, and and throw stones at people who do something different, as long as it's, you know, something that we've evolved with is a natural thing is 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 wrong. It's 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 totally wrong. And and you're right. You know, the climate climate has changed and 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 it's constantly changing. You know, you look through this mid this ice age. Uh, ice ages in like the, the 1400s 1500s which is one of the reasons why they reckon that the norse were kicked out of greenland because it was getting too cold uh, just one of the reasons um and it happens all the time but the, the yeah the, there is evidence that yeah the fossil fuel and all that kind of stuff is, is what's you know accelerating it at the moment and i think you know any, any kind of sane person is going to question what the governments are doing now and and big corps because it it's very obvious that it's it's just for the bottom line and and, and to you know, line their own pockets, um, you know, which is something that is, is it was a big thing for me as well. Because as a kid growing up in England, and you look at the BBC and you think, oh, the prime minister's got to be the cleverest person in the in, in, in you know in, in the country to get that job. What what a fantastic job! And then you get up and you get a bit more cynical and you go, no, they're all in it just for their mates, just to yeah get some extra money and look at all the scandals that dog you know like trump like boris johnson they're, they're, they're all at it they're all just trying to yeah yeah make money for themselves and you know and, and their cronies it's it's bloody terrible and look what it's ha what's happening to the planet you know like the tobacco industries you know denied for decades um that you know tobacco you know accelerated cancer and gave people cancer and and it's the same with the fossil fuel industry. That you know they, they've had active campaigns to 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 muddy the waters and and and, and get rid of evidence that you know fossil fuels are damaging the environment and, and and the earth. And it's it just comes down to bloody money all the time. It just seems to be, yeah. Do we never learn any lessons? So, well, look, we had a thing. I, I don't know if this went around the world, but we had a thing where. And by the way, they're always like I said, they're always taking shiny objects and turning that. They, they, I don't know if someone stuck a straw in this turtle's nose, but they had a sea turtle with a, a straw stuck in his nose. Yeah. Went, Look at this. Look at this. Sea turtle's got a straw stuck in his nose. And as a people, we went, oh, no, we can't use plastic straws anymore. And literally within a week in California, I was still living in, in SoCal at the time. Yeah. Every straw went to paper. Now, yeah. okay, great. We're using paper straws now. 
But then we fixed the fucking problem. Everything became about a paper straw. And if you had a plastic straw, you became the problem. You're yeah. the problem. It's like, number one, we're grownups. Why in the fuck are we using straws? That's number one. Yeah. Grown up. You don't, you don't suck your food. You, you, you drink it like a, like a real man. So stop with the straws. We don't need a straw. Right. Yeah. Number one. Number two. You know, we we think that oh, I'm do I'm a do gooder. I'm using a paper straw. It's like, are you are you on crack? Are you insane? Yeah. What, what the hell are we doing? Again, let's do a shiny object so we don't. You know, we we have we have seals over here with with plastic in their crap, but over here we're fine. We're we're still using plastic everything except for a straw, yeah, which yeah. Is zero. And someone said, oh come on, Vin, it's a good start. No, it's not a good start. It's bullshit. It's complete <laughs> bullshit. And that's the thing that bothers me. Um, allergies, you know, you, you talked about, you know, allergies and the whole thing, you know, Inuits, you know, w whenever I did my first movie, Fatter Documentary, that's that's the poster that's behind us. You know, I talked a lot about uh, Vilmar Stefansson, um, who got stuck with the Inuit people. He was supposed to be there for a month or so. He got stuck for like six or eight months. And when he came back, he told all of his courts at the hospital, look, I'm I lost 40 pounds. I'm healthier. I feel good. My my stress is gone. I don't have any blood pressure. No problem. And he talked about these Inuit people back in the 1920s. And he said, look, they, they don't have they, they don't have uh, any problem with uh, dental with teeth. They, yeah. they don't know what a cavity looks like. Um, they, they don't, you mentioned heart disease and they go, come again. How does that work? Yeah. Heart disease. People die from what their heart gets clogged up. We don't know what you're talking about. That was unheard of to these people. Yeah. And yet everyone said, you know, Stephans and you're, you're, you're a kook. You're nuts. You're crazy. Okay. You know, which prompted him to do a whole study where he locked himself in the hospital with his buddy. And they did that famous study to prove that you can eat this way and get healthier where all their food was given to them. Right. Yeah. We, we can't do that experiment and we can't lock humans into a hospital, but you did the same sort of thing. I mean, allergies, right? Yeah. When we were kids back when we were kids. Did you know a kid with a peanut allergy? Yeah. No, no, it, it didn't exist. No, it didn't. You know, now a peanut can kick a kid's ass. Yeah, that, that's where we are. It, when, when we get to a society, all right. Oh, hang on, this is for Debbie. Hang on, let me get my glasses off. <laughs> this, uh, this is going to be on my Instagram. Debbie, you ready? When we get to a society where a fucking peanut can kick your ass, we're done. We're done as a people. It's over with. Stay motivated. All right, Debbie's going to use that on my Instagram. All right, so at any rate. <laughs> I get upset about these things because I'm looking around going, peanuts are kicking our ass nowadays. How did that happen? Yeah. yeah. How did that happen? That that happened. We're, I'm 60. You're 53, 54. 54 yeah. We didn't know. If, if you would have said to us in 1978, look, <clears throat> we know a kid with a peanut allergy. It's like, a what? Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. It doesn't exist. It's like, what are you, what are you punking me? Yeah. Are yeah. you serious? No. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get on an airplane, get a peanut. Yeah. Even when I was in uh, in college, um, yeah, we, we weren't taught about gluten intolerances or dairy intolerances or anything like that. And when I went out and you know got my first job, no one said, oh, I've got a dairy intolerance. You know, can you suggest items or can you do replacements? I would have gone, what the hell are you talking about? And it's only probably in the last 20 years it started creeping in with gluten allergies, gluten allergies. And now that the last restaurant I had, which was three or four years ago, we had to do a regular menu. We had to do, uh, we had to print out a, a menu that had, had you know, it without gluten. We had to do one without dairy because I was asked so many times in the night, you know, uh, uh, in a service, oh, what, what, what can this guy have to eat? He's dairy intolerant. It's just like, what, what the hell? So I'm doing three different menus and it's probably, it's probably increased now for, I don't know, peanut intolerances and all that kind of stuff it's it, it really has been a, a huge sea change in in people's diets it's um it, it, it's, it's nuts and it's really worrying 
<laughs> yeah. Was it? Well, 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 yeah. What's where, where are we going to be in twenty or thirty years' time? If yeah, if you take that, if you take that 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 arrow on the graph and see where it's going, project that forward twenty years, and we are totally screwed. Oh, yeah. Look, I've always said we're going to break under the weight of our own weight. You yeah. know, um, and, and I'm not kidding about that. When when my wife and I we we don't go to restaurants very often because I don't want to be around seed oils and all the crap they use in restaurants to keep it yeah. cheap. But, but every now and then we end up in a restaurant and there's you know when we do go the the waiter or waitress comes up, uh, um, do we have any we do we do yeah. we have any allergies? And I always go look at us we're sixty we don't have <laughs> allergies. You know and that's the way I put it to them. I bet you're a terrible customer. <laughs> Thank you for the, yeah, and for the they're, they're, yeah, and every time I do that, my wife goes, "You know, they're spitting in your food now, right?" <laughs> good, good. I need a little extra spit. <laughs> I, I need that. That's how we stay healthy. But when yeah. I was a kid, we played yeah. football. You, you know, we, you know, they, they would come and squirt water in our mouth. You suck on the hose, give it to the next guy. He sucks on the same thing. And nobody got sick. No one yeah. died. Yeah. Now, you know, a, a kid is like, oh, no, I got, I got to Purell up before I have something to drink. It's like, yeah. it, it's, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, I knew I knew I was going to enjoy talking to you because I love yeah. crazy. Thank and you. It's, it, it's such common sense. If you think about it, it's like, fuck's sake. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We came out of the trees you know, a million years ago and we've, we've evolved with picking our food out of dirt and, and yeah, fruit falls on the floor and it starts fermenting and, and, and we're, we're, we're eating it. And that's, yeah, that 90% of our bodies aren't human. They're, they're, they're bacteria that live inside us. So how the hell, do you think we're going to survive if you start you know, using these chemicals that kill 99.9% .9 of all germs and bacteria? It's like, what are you doing? You, you, you're just creating an environment that's, that cannot be sustained. At some point, you're going to have to go out of your little sanitized bubble and you'll be exposed to that bacteria. And boom, you're, you're, you're a goner. <laughs> we, we had two ways of, of cleaning food when I was a kid that fell on the floor. Here are the two ways you cleaned it. Number one. <laughs> it. There was what was known as the three second rule. Yep. If it fell and you could get it up in three seconds, doesn't count. <laughs> and the other rule was uh, the sign of the cross, the Christian sign of the cross. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You pick it up and you just make the sign of the cross. Like you drop a piece of candy on the floor. Fix it. Yeah. You could drop it in dog shit. Sign <laughs> of the cross. Put it in your mouth. Brand new. Uh, Cleaned everything. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I tell this to people, and they go, are you making that up? It's like, no, I don't know. Maybe it's because I grew up in the deep South. Something fall on the floor. If it went past three seconds, that's fine. You can pick it up. Sign of the cross. Father, Son, <laughs> Holy Ghost. Uh, this is the God. candy I love the most. And you just put it in your mouth. Yeah. I do that today. You drop something on the floor and pick it up and put it in your mouth. You might as well be the devil. <laughs> yeah. People will look at you as if, you just murdered someone. Yeah, uh, it's, it's 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 got crazy levels now. Yeah, and, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, duh. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so 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 the food I was eating was, um, yeah, hardly washed as well. So you, you, you know, with, with your skin in the seal, you you've, you've got the seal on on the ice. And, and you've got his guts open and you, you're, you're skinning it. And then you just cut the meat off and you, you, you eat, you, you know, but half the time you're eating it raw. Um, uh, yeah, you're eating yeah, a, a lot of the intestines and the offal, which are super good. Um, and the Inuit have known that for, for centuries, for you know, thousands of years, that you know, the, the most prized parts of the animal will be like the liver, the lungs, the heart, because that's they're the ones that they've worked out are, are the most nutrient dense yeah, pieces of food on the planet that you you, you can possibly eat, um, and, and which is why you know like when when, when carnivores like lions and hyenas and stuff get a kill, they'll go straight for the guts because that's the that that's the, that's the yeah you know, the most valuable to them you know as a living being to, you know, to get the nutrients and all the benefits that from from that it's um it's uh it's, yeah it's super important I, and that's something that's gone as well you know. As a kid, you know, steak and kidney pie here in England is, is a classic. But yeah. you, you don't see it yeah, you know, often anymore. People go, kidneys? Oh, don't they process urine or liver? God, doesn't that do some horrible thing within the body? And yeah, it does. That's why it tastes so good and good. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm, I've never liked um, liver. 
And, uh, you know, I, I've always been in health and fitness. And when I was a kid, I ate a bunch of liver. My grandmother knew how to get it to some degree of making it taste okay for me. Okay. I would gut it down once, twice a week. But I would also take a lot of uh, desiccated liver, not defat it, you know, you know, yeah. just because when you defat it, you get rid of all the nutrients. Yeah. But, you know, they would tell you take three or four. No, I was taking just like the bodybuilders from the, the golden era. This is back early 1970s. I was taking somewhere between mm, 30 and 50 of these liver tablets a day. Yeah. And I would literally crush them up, stick them in a blender and whiz them up in a blender and just drink them down. I was willing right. to do that every single day, you know, a couple of times a day, because I wouldn't take them all at once. I'd take some now, take some in the middle, some at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's something I still do. Now, I don't do it all the time, and I should, but I'll get, I'll buy some, I'll buy, you know, desiccated liver. Yeah. And, uh, take it for a while. And then forget about it. And I go, oh, you know what? I need. And by the way, when I start taking it again, you feel different. Yeah. And I'm taking way more than what they're telling you to take. Huh. Right. Because I want to get that liver. And when you look at all the great bodybuilders back in the day, oh, look, they were taking steroids, but not like the stuff these guys are taking today. Yeah. yeah. You know, Frank Zane. Frank Zane still takes liver. He still takes desiccated liver all the time or eats real liver. It makes a huge difference. And I don't think people, they go, well, you say you get more B12 and more. No, you get a lot of nutrients that you just wouldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. Which is the bottom line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and a lot of the a lot of the intestines and the offal from seal and whale and and, and walrus contain vi vitamin C. So does the blubber, um, which uh, one of the main questions I was asked was, how do you not get scurvy? You know, how, why aren't your teeth falling out? And it's because, yeah, because the, the vitamin C is 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 pretty high in in a lot of the internal organs and in the fat of um, seal and whale. And it, it turns out if you ferment seal fat as well, it gives it. A really strong taste which is an acquired taste but um but that converts some of the nutrients there into vitamin c again so it's pretty high in vitamin c so there's there's plenty of vitamin c knocking about and the reason the you know the old colonial explorers had scurvy even when they were with the inuit was because they flatly refused to eat their food you know they looked down on the food and the the, the danish are, 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 were guilty as as well because the, you know they're the colonial in in you know, in brackets masters of, of of greenland and they 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 still today look kind of down on their food as as being kind of primitive slightly and you know when they came in 300 years ago into greenland that the, the, they they moved the inuit around because they were trying to make money about from the fishing and the hunting and they you know, didn't they, they almost forced them to eat the danish food and it's it's a real problem out there now, which is in a lot of indigenous communities across the world. Is they're be, almost being forced to eat the Western food, or it's, it's so available that you know their traditional foodstuffs have kind of kind of waned and and, and got, gone out of fashion. And they've got problems with obesity and alcoholism and all you know heart disease, which like you said before, they never used to have at all. And right. obviously, it's because yeah, you know, we're pumping we're pumping them full of all this crap that we're flying around the world and. Is pumped full of chemicals. That's why. Um, which, yeah, and, and the reaction I got from um, from the kayak thing is Facebook and uh, social media is massive in Greenland, you know, because it's so remote and people are spread out um, that, yeah, the, the, the social media is a great way of them connecting with each other. And I was on the news uh, in Greenland. There, there's only 60,000 people living in the whole of Greenland, and the, the country is the size of Europe. So right. you, you can fit you can fit the entire population twice over in Wembley Stadium here in London. It, it's just crazy, crazy figures, and um, uh, so so it's super spread out. And and because of Facebook, and I had the, the the tracker on my website, they could see when I was coming in, and that they were so supportive of me as I went, and it was. It was un unbelievable because before I was kind of I oh, got this English, you know, this Englishman, this white guy coming over doing the kayak and eating their food. It could be taken as if, yeah, as, as if he wants to do it better. You know, you know how these things can get skewed. Sure, sometimes. sure, absolutely. But wow, the, the Greenlandic people were amazing. That they, they, they were, you know, youngsters and yeah, you know, used to get super old people coming down to the to the harbour to welcome me, shake my hands, and they were the the. The, the overriding you know 
piece, you know, item that I got out of that was that they were proud that someone from outside green and was taking an interest in their food and promoting it and it was obviously having such a fantastic effect on on me while i while i collect you know eight to twelve hours every day up, up the coast in in yeah sub-zero conditions um it was yeah a, a real eye-opener but the, yeah the greenlandic people were unbelievable and and, and because of that they, they, they were bringing me bags of food down to down you know to the harbor you know seal guts and all kinds of interesting stuff which was uh which was brilliant but uh, yeah, it was a, it was a cracking experience. And and then and going back to the test results, we haven't even touched that on that yet. I don't know how much time we got left. Oh, we we got time. We good. It was so before the day before I left for Greenland, I had a whole bunch of tests with Tim Spector at uh, St Thomas Hospital in London. So I had a DEXA scan, I had urine, blood, and stool samples taken. I had the grip test, the lung test. Yeah, loads of stuff. Um, yeah, they they weighed me, um, and then. I pretty much did the, exactly the same tests two days after I got back. And the results that I've got back so far is that I, I lost 13 kilo. So that's two stone. Uh, that's 28 pounds. He lost about 30 pounds, folks. I, I, yeah. I'll keep converting stone. Okay, thanks. No thanks. Problem. No problem. Yeah, and, and I lost that in the first four weeks. And I, I was I was getting kind of worried, thinking, geez, I've, I've lost that that quickly. If I keep going at that rate, I'm going to crash because – yeah, or, or, or yeah, you know, I'm obviously using the, the stored fat energy in yeah you know, in my body. Right. Once that goes, am I going to crash? Going to happen? But it just went down and then leveled out, and I, I stayed the same weight, thirteen kilo, you know, twenty eight pounds less than I was when I started the entire time. Um, and the other big difference was my body fat percentage went dropped by ten percent. I think it was it, it it seemed like it was quite high at like twenty three, twenty four, and it went down to thirteen percent, which I, I, that's never, ripped. I know, okay. Most people don't realize when you get measured on a DEXA scan, uh, just to give people an example, because people go, how does it compare to the calipers? Okay, if yeah. we're at 13% on a DEXA scan, you, you can show calipers at like 8 9%, something like that. So okay. that's, you were pretty ripped out at that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, I felt it. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing was my cholesterol level halved. Um, which yeah, that that's been something that's been drummed into me as a chef and and, and as a consumer in England for the last twenty years is don't eat animal fats. You got to have these low fat margarines and and oils and all this kind of crap. And and actually no, my, my cholesterol halved. You know, I, I've never smoked and never, never taken drugs or anything like that. But my cholesterol halved, which I'm purely eating yeah you know, animal fats of you know, wow. seal, walrus, and whale. Which I, I I found as a layman, really as as a nutrition layman, I, you know, I found that astonishing. Um, which I'm I'm really interested in doing some more experiments with that as well, because that that is a real eye opener. Well, we've been talking about that on this show for years. You know, my friend Dave Feldman has done studies that show that as you up your cholesterol and your food intake, you can lower your overall serum cholesterol to a normal level. Uh -huh. Cholesterol, if we don't take it, our bodies will make it. Right. It's yeah. something we, you know, it's not an essential, it's a non-essential, which means that our bodies will make it. That's how important it is for every cell in our bodies. Yet we live in a country, and you do too, where doctors will say, Oh, you gotta lower that cholesterol in LDL. Ooh, that's the bad cholesterol. Yeah. It's complete, it's complete bullshit. And um, you know, there, there is there is a problem with some of the LDL people that have um um you know different lipid scores you know like if you have a small dense particle you know an apoa or an apo b yeah. but it's like three or four percent of the population that's not everyone right and those people it's that's a whole different thing and that's a whole medical thing but it's amazing uh look i want to do a quick ad here and then i want to come back and finish up with kind of your day-to-day -day of what it was like in a kayak you mentioned eating dried foods and uh fermented foods uh, I want to know how you got the foods. Were, were these Inuits going, hey, this guy's going to be in our town tomorrow. Let's bring him some whale blubber. Or were yeah. you killing these animals yourself and and uh, skinning them and, and or dressing them out and skinning them and cooking? I want to know all of that. But before that, sure. folks, the one thing I'm sure the adventure chef would agree with is olive oil. And not all olive oil is created equal. <laughs> As a matter of fact, here in the U.S., you can legally cut olive oil up to 40% and still call it 100% pure, unadulterated olive oil. I'll give you an example. 
every grocery store you walk into in the United States, every major grocery store is going to have a product like Bartoli, right? They put an Italian name on it. You go, oh, it must come from Italy. It's probably a gondolier in there, you know, pushing a boat on the label and the whole thing. It's like, wait a minute. Can they have that many olives to where they can have tons of this stuff in every major grocery store in the United States? No, they're cutting it. They're cutting it up to 40%. It's crap. It's hard to find real olive oil. Now, if you want the good stuff, Villa Capelli, they've been a sponsor of this show for at least 10 years. Hell, Capelli is dead. Paul Capelli died during the course of this show. Great man. But his husband took over the operation, and uh, Stephen Crutchfield is still running it over in Italy. Villa Capelli is alive and well. There's a couple of ways to save. Number one, putting in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, will save you 10%. Now, if you spend over $125 after the discount, which means if I'm doing the math, you have to spend about $145, you get a 10% discount, knock that $14 off, you're still above $125, you'll get free shipping. So think about that, three liter ten of olive oil, you get a couple of herbs, a couple of spices, you throw it in there, you, you got all of this great stuff, you're getting free shipping, you're getting 10% off with promo code Vinny, you can't lose, you can't lose. And getting three liters at a time is doing, I buy six liters, I buy two, three liter tens every time, because this Italian doesn't want to run out. I, I can't run out of olive oil. That's it. So that's what we do, folks. Villa Capelli, promo code Vinny, no wimpy Y, V-I-N-N-I-E. We're talking to adventure chef Mike Keene. Mike, I'm somewhat of a kayaker myself. I, I have a I was just in South Carolina with my surf ski, my stellar yeah. surf ski. Those things have no chines on them. Uh, if you move, if you if you fart or, or burp, that thing is slipping over. <laughs> so it wouldn't be good for Greenland, right? That, that thing is built like a barrel. There's no chine on it whatsoever. Uh, okay. And I built myself a nice Greenland-style kayak uh, by the great, um, I don't know if you know, uh, Guillemot Kayaks, um, that, that guy. Um, uh, Nick Shada, he built some of the best cedar strip kayaks in the world. I took one of his farms yeah. and built myself a nice, what I like to call a three season kayak because there's, there's chines built in, you know, some, st there's some st yeah. stability in it. Um, what type of kayak did you use? I'm, I'm assuming you use molded plastic, which I guess you are adding to that seal poop with your plastic out there on the water. <laughs> yeah, probably. You need, yeah, a, you need a plastic there. boat, right? Because yeah, you, yeah. Could crash, you could crush it on ice and you would be dead. Yeah, Tell yeah. Me about your boat and what you did. It's got to be tough out there. So, yeah, the, 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 on the kayaks, the really lightweight ones are like fiberglass, carbon fiber, this kind of stuff. But they chip, you know, like in Greenland, every launch or, or, or landing you do is on rock or ice and it's going to destroy a carbon fiber kayak you know like that so it's a mold of plastic it's tough as boots it's great um yeah i i, I, I hold it over ice for a long time as well actually I, you know, sometimes like four or five hundred meters trying to get round a really bad tide in the fjords or whatever um it's a it's a british made kayak just a just a regular sea kayak about five meters long uh, weighs 27 kilo, which using your your incredible brain would be what 50 50 pounds or something like that 50 60 pounds. Oh, wait wait you said how many kilos 27 kilo yeah so, double it uh, so yeah 50 uh, about 55 pounds something like yeah that. and then the equipment inside it pretty much doubled that weight so yeah was, uh, the kayak with all the gear was about 100 100 pounds plus me uh, and I, I, I did weigh, uh, what was it? 90, yeah, 91 kilo. And, uh, that, that a lot of that weight went as I, as I was going. So that was pretty cool. But, um, yeah. So, so my day to day thing was, um, and again, out there in Greenland in the summer, as soon as you hit the Arctic circle, you've got 24 hour day sunlight. The sun doesn't dip below the horizon. So, you know, the nine to five type window where you'd normally be you know, doing most of your activity, it doesn't matter. So if the weather's bad during that, you'll sleep during the day and then I you know, get out of the tent about seven or eight PM and the sun's still blaring, pack up and then you, you kayak overnight and finish at five in the morning. Um and, and the sun is with you the whole way. It's yeah. crazy. So yeah, you you've got an eye mask, yeah, just to just to get some kind of semblance of dark when 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 you're trying to sleep in the tent. Um 
so yeah I, uh, all, all my all my kayaking was done in in big long long stretches so i, I didn't do two hours and then rest for a bit because it was too bloody cold as soon as you as soon as you stop you've got biting winds and you start shivering you you, you can feel hypothermia coming on pretty quickly so when you stop you have to make sure that you've got a, you, you've got a good uh, place to camp you can get out of all your wet gear because on the kayak you, you just get wet straight away e- even if you're in a, a bloody dry suit everything seems to get wet um so when you stop it's got to be for a period where you, you get everything off get your dry clothes on get in the tent you know if you can get a fire going brilliant uh, most of the time i had a little gas canister that was in the, you know kept it inside the tent because it was too cold um to, to to put it outside or too windy um and then get some food inside it straight away. And then I was in the sleeping bag, which was rated to like minus 20. So it's a big old sleeping bag. Yeah. But there wasn't a single night where I didn't have to have yeah, trousers, two pairs of socks, three layers and a hat yeah, inside the sleeping bag. So it was so bloody cold. Um, yeah, it, it was amazing. I was, and yeah, when I was planning it, I, was, I hadn't planned on the weather being that unseasonably bad. Um, but it was reassuring. You know, every every place I stopped and everyone I spoke to said, "Jesus, what are you doing?" And the, the, the weather's bloody appalling. You know, the, the first fifty days I, I saw the sun once, wow, um, which was kind of yeah, it's kind of depressing. And it's <laughs> when, when you look back on it, you think, "What, what the hell was I thinking?" Jesus, why, why didn't I give up? But yeah, it, it, it didn't even kind of cross my mind at the time. It was just like, "No, it's, this is it. You just got to keep going." So, um, so when, now I, I just I want to get to the food, but I can't imagine I'm thinking through it, getting into a wetsuit, a, a dry suit that, you know, you have perspiration on the inside. That's got to freeze up immediately as soon as you get out. Then yeah. you got to slip that thing back on the next day. Oh, it's miserable, so yeah. That had yeah. to be the worst thing. In, you, you, I have dry suits. I, I know yeah. I hate I hate dry suits. So you got that yeah. thing around your neck and around your wrist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Bottles, yeah. yeah it, it's uh, it's horrible. And. So you were doing, who, who made your dry suit? Was it like an NRS or which brand did you use? It's um, all, all my gear was from Palm, Palm Equipment here in the UK. Yeah. Um, it's, a good, it's a good dry suit. Um, yeah, like you say, it's, it's kind of tight around the neck. So, but it's, it's got to be others, you know, otherwise you're going to let the water in. Um, yeah, it's a good dry suit, but yeah, it, it gets bloody cold as well. And there's quite a few nights in the tent where I've got these water bladders that sit in my, in my life jacket at the back. Uh, they hold three liters, and all three of them were, were totally frozen overnight I- I- inside the tent. And yeah, I- even when it was stuffed down my back, and I've got that kind of warmth going on, it 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 didn't melt enough to 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 be drinkable. So you have to kind of push all the ice out, and then go and walk and find somewhere where there's where there's some moving water to get some yeah, well fresh water obviously to um to to, to top the water up. So. Yeah, that happened quite a few times, which was pretty bloody miserable. But yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head with the um with the dry suit. That the worst bit of everything was getting into that dry suit. So yeah, you pack your tent up, so there's nothing left in the tent. Your kayak's almost ready to go, and the last thing before you break break your tent mm-hmm. out, get out of your dry clothes and into that cold that cold dry suit. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Well, oh, I started man. thinking about that. It's like he's taking that off. There's no way he could dry it out before it freezes up, and he's yeah. got to get back in that thing the next day. Uh, food. You, you mentioned dry food. Are we talking jerky type meat? Yeah, all, all, all jerky. So pretty much 50% cod and 50, 50% uh, niku, which is dried seal or whale or walrus. But dried seal is the most common. Um, and and it, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if many of your listeners have, have eaten seal or, or, or any of those sea mammals, but you get, it's called train oil, which is what they used to, you know, boil the blubber down to you know to light lamps in europe and heating and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff and it's got it's kind of like cod liver oil so that kind of fish oil type type right taste to it so it's quite it's, it's quite an acquired taste but yeah it's it, I, I really like it it's great <laughs> but the dry the dry jerky stuff is is is, is great and it's great just you, know, you just have an open bag or a, a little tub yeah you know, under the bungee on on the kayak and you, i'm just snacking that the whole time as as i'm kayaking I didn't usually, you know, when I got out of the sleeping bag, I didn't usually have a big, big meal or anything before I started kayaking. So I just kind of snacked on this dry stuff for eight or 10 hours. And then had, a, you know, when I stopped, I had a big, big, you know, most of the time it was a stew. So when I stopped in a settlement and I knew that I had, say, eight days um, until I got to the next settlement, I'd cook up a big saucepan of 
that seal stew or whale stew um, with 50, yeah, 40 or 50 percent blubber in um, and then chill it down, package it and then just heat it up as I went. I, I kind of learned that lesson pretty, pretty fast because I was expecting to catch fish because I had a fishing rod me. I was expecting to catch catch fish and then you know, cook up a nice little fishy dish. But I, I, I did that in the first week. And yeah, you've got to take the bones out of the fish. It's such right. a nice, and it, everything's freezing and you're shivering. And you think, what the fuck am I doing with this fish? And I ended up just mashing it, bones and all, in, into the pan to cook. <laughs> yeah. And then I was just eating it and spitting the bones out, thinking, fuck me, I've got to, I've, I've got to change something here. Which yeah. is why as soon as I got to the next settlement, it's stop even think about trying to be fancy mike just just functional food just something that's going to be heated up real quick or at worst you can eat when it's cold so stews or stews all the way i know guys i've talked to guys that have walked across uh the south pole antarctica and yeah. um they they tend to use things like um you know just straight coconut oil and butter and you know just eat you know they, they would have pounds and pounds and blocks of butter but I'm guessing you were staying away from that because you were trying to stay as close to the Inuit diet or right on the Inuit diet. Yeah, it was right on. It, yeah, any cooking fat was um, rendered down seal fat. So seal fat melts at a really uh, 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 almost room temperature. You know, you just leave it out and it will start to leak leak oil. So oh. yeah, if I had a pan on the go, just a bit of you know a big big chunk of seal seal fat straight in the pan and it melts. And then you right. and then you put whatever in to cook and uh, yeah that the, there are herbs out there not many and not many that you'd want to put in any kind of quantity um so yeah no onions garlic anything like that so for a stew i was just putting the, the chopped up meat in and then water on top and that was it straight you know and, and boil it for a couple of hours yeah i use a lot of uh suet and and uh tallow around here to cook um yeah there's no way of us getting seal fat no one's selling that here, right? In the no. state, you have to be up there. there. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no way, and, and and that was a real big thing for me when I came back. So I, I was thinking, shit, I've, yeah, you know, I've lost all this weight. I've, I've, I've never felt, um, never felt better. And the energy levels I had at the end of the day were incredible. I've, right. There's, there's no way I could have, I could have done what I did on my regular English diet. There's, yeah, you know, I've never had that much energy. You know, even after a ten hour kayak. I only stopped because you know I needed I needed a toilet break or something. It was it wasn't it wasn't particularly because I was tired or anything like that. And I, you know the whole way, I, I I didn't have any injuries. I you know I, I didn't feel fatigued. I didn't get any niggles. You know anything like that, which I was really expecting to you know have to deal with some kind of injury at some point. But um, whether it was luck or whether it was it was the diet, I'm not sure. But I, you know I, I'd like to attribute it to the diet and 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 and, and the strength that it gave me um and then that, that was the big thing coming back so i think geez you know i've, I've never I've, I've never described myself as, as lean and toned before and but and this probably for the first time in my life i, I actually felt kind of wiry and i thought shit i want to keep this um but that's going to be really difficult because there's no way i can replicate you know that kind of exercise here you know i i, I can't do the equivalent of 10 hours a day kayaking here in england so yeah, every time I eat carbs or anything now, I, I kind of feel guilty, which is which is stupid because the carbs I'm eating aren't like pro, super processed stuff. Um, but what what I'm aiming for a lot more now is is the, the, there's loads of pigs around here. It's, it's, it's a big uh, you know, pork production area, but yeah, most of it is really good. It's not factory farmed. A lot of it's organic. So yeah, like you said before about the pork belly, pork belly is is awesome. Yeah, the fat on the pork belly and the skin, the crackling um and i'm I'm eating a lot of uh yeah kidneys liver hearts as well that's um that, that, that that's all good stuff well yeah I, i'll tell you quickly because now we are getting a little long here but um one of the things i do you know i i eat a very high fat you know almost zero carb diet yeah um, and um you know i i don't just sit there and eat blocks of butter like people you'll see on on instagram but you know my vitamin company, I make a really good fish and krill oil. So okay. I, I'm on that every day. Um, I mentioned, you know, that ad Villa Capelli. Yeah. I, I drink at least a shot of that oil, a good full ounce, ounce and a half every day. Okay. And every single day that that goes, you know, I just, you know, I have a little shot glass and I just shoot it yeah. down. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, beef tallow, you know, we cook with a lot of that. 
um, uh, coconut oil. Yeah, it's coconut oil is straight brain food and it's cheap, uh -huh. right? It mimics all the stuff you're talking about here. Um, and you know, a lot of marbled up beef, you know, we eat a lot of fish. I eat a lot of fish, I mean, the, the omega threes and fish. And then I started looking around going because I work for myself, I work from home, and I work a lot in the evening, I can make my day w whenever I want. Yeah. So I like to do things while the sun's shining, you know, I'll work from, you know, starting at around three, going all the way until 10, 11, 12 at night. You know, it's just what I do. And one day I was going to the gym. And um, as I was heading to the gym, I I, I kind of waved to the guy working my garden and I waved to the other guy cutting my grass. And I, I thought about that the whole time I was in the gym. It's like, I'm paying them to do work around my house. And I'm paying the gym owner to come to his gym and to pretend work. Yeah. It, it made no sense to me. It's like, okay, you're fired. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> we took over all the yard work. Yeah. I told him, look, you're doing a great job. I want to do this myself. And I said, look, when I'm busy, because I do documentaries and stuff, when I get really busy, would you mind coming in and picking up the slack when I can't do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. Nobody had a problem with that. Yeah. But I went out and bought a push mower, and I push my whole yard. It takes a couple of hours. Yeah. There's some grades on it and everything else. It's a great workout. There's some satisfaction to it. We do all the work around here. Um, everyone thinks I'm crazy because I don't buy, a, I don't rent a wood splitter once a year to start splitting wood. I have an ax and I split my own wood. I, I do all of it, right? Yeah. I'm doing all of it where I used to just say, hey, hey, guy, come here with your wood splitter and start yeah. splitting up, right? No, I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm doing it all. And I still go to the gym. So what I'm telling you here, Mike, is that you can, you can, uh, you can get close to it. Yeah. Right. You could get pretty damn close to it. Yeah. You're not going to be on your kayak eight hours a day, but you can end up with three or four hours of good work every day. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're doing chef stuff and you're on your feet, that all matters. Yeah. Right? That keeps you getting yeah. Yeah. So you can keep the body. You yeah. can definitely keep the body by, by doing those things. You know, everyone thinks, Oh, to exercise, I got to go do a Jane Fonda routine, or I got to go do a Peloton class, or I have to go to the gym, or I got to go do the box and flip a tire end over end. And yeah. I, I saw that one day. I was like, a guy is flipping a tire and uh, you're a big tractor tire end over end. I didn't have the heart to tell a guy, you know, if you flip it on its edge, you can roll a fucking thing. We figured out the wheel <laughs> back in the caveman days. Then, he, he would have loved that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I looked at another guy and he had a, a like a, a 12 pound mall and he was beating a tire with it. He was just hitting the tire. And I went, <laughs> oh, I could just go home, split my own wood. I could save money. Right. And do and, and have an accomplishment. Sta yeah, you, start, yeah, yeah. you start splitting and stacking cords of wood. You when, right, right. at the end of the day, you know you've done something. Yeah, yeah. Right. You push your lawnmower for three hours up and down grades. You've done something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That's a day I don't have to do aerobics. I've done it. Yeah, yeah. Right? I don't have to go do it, get on my spinner or my rowing machine or whatever. I've done it. Yeah, and, and doing that works so many different muscle groups as well. You know that, like. Yeah, it, it, even when I when I was training for the kayak, it, it, when I went to the gym, I was doing the arm bike thing. You know, when you go like that. Sure. And it, you, you'd have thought the muscles were pretty much identical, but it, yeah, just t turning that was totally different muscles. Yeah, it's it, it, it was amazing that yeah how different a, yeah a, 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 an exercise that you would think was really similar yeah you know, can be. So and, and that that kind of what you were talking about yeah you know, mowing the lawn and doing the yard and stuff is 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 how we exercised you know over millennia uh, yeah as we've evolved you know like one day we're hunting deer yeah then, then we're chopping wood we're building shelters so you're using different muscle groups the whole time and, that, and that's what the human body is uh, yeah, has evolved into you know it's it's, it's not this these huge routines down the gym necessarily yeah and you know you know we have to do more of that stuff and by the way kayak is all in the hips it's all the obliques 
it, it's yeah, so much awesome. <laughs> you're twisting i mean you're twisting in that boat if you're using your arms you're doing something wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We we dip, you know, we use those wing paddles. I don't know what kind of paddle you have. Those wing paddles are cupped. A Euro paddle is called. Yeah. Just yeah, we, we dip them straight, like we stab them straight in, like yeah. that. And you just once you stab it in, you just pull through your you pull your body until yeah. that paddle is close to your hip and you're bringing it out and you're stabbing yeah. the other way. Yeah, yeah. You know, but that's a whole different you know, we don't, you know, like I've used Greenland paddles, you know, those little thin paddles where you just wave them across the water. That's a yeah. whole different technique. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, it's all something. Um, Mike, uh, where can people find you and all of your, um, you, you, tell them where they can find your, your um, what do you call it, YouTube and everything else, because yeah. I'm fascinated much, with all of that. If you go to at Mike Keen Cooks, so Mike Keen is K-E-E-N and Cooks, C-O-O-K-S. That's on Instagram, threads, Twitter, whatever you want to call it nowadays, and on YouTube as well. And my website is mikekeen.co, just that, mikekeen.co. Go on there. But Instagram is probably the best place you'll find up-to-date stuff. Um, yeah. But Mike Keen Cooks across all, all platforms, that's what you'll find out. And uh, whatever adventures I've got planning next will be on there first. Uh, hang on, Mike. I want to say goodbye to you off the air. Folks, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytartaris.com. Click through the banner. Bookmark it and use it every time is how we keep this show free. Also, uh, Debbie wants me to let you guys know about the uh, NSNG ebook. Everyone likes to get it. Look, it's 10 bucks. Some people have used that to lose upwards of 400 pounds. So go get that book. Um, it's easy to read. It's easily digestible. Pun intended. And uh, you will be better for it. Um, but uh, but uh, that's about it. On behalf of Mike Keen, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>